Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand up and do the vision if we can. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you. We magnify you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the, the praise and the worship. We thank you for the, the presence that's already in this room. We thank you, Lord Jesus, right now for all that you're doing in our life, Father God. Now, we settle ourselves, Father God, to receive the word of God. We settle ourselves to receive from heaven. We settle ourselves to receive from a live, loving, living God. We thank you right now, Father God. You never leave us nor forsake us, Father God. And there is a word for us for this time and for this season, Father God. And we receive it right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. Now, Father God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you're doing in our life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for never leaving us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's do the vision if we can. The Spirit, Lord God, is upon us. And he has anointed us to preach the gospel. And to raise up a body of believers to be the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, a church of our walls. Our goals are to teach the word of God so that anytime you can see the word, hear the word, and understand the word of God, you can be converted into the word that you see, hear, and understand. And once we are converted, we can now strengthen our brother. And as witnesses, declare with boldness, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Come on, give God a praise for that. Hallelujah. Repeat after me. Receive, change, give. Oh, y'all got to say it a little louder now. You got to say it over those masks. Receive, change, give. Receive, change, give. Today we're going to receive the word of God. We're going to be changed into the word that we see, hear, and understand. And once we are changed or once we are converted, we can now give that word out to our friends, our family, and everyone we come in contact with. If you believe that in service, if you believe that online, come on, give God a praise right where you are. Come on, give God a praise right where you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wasn't that such a good video? That you would keep your heart passion and your heart posture towards God. You know, this morning I feel such a press in the sanctuary. I think our, our praise got to be louder than our situations. Can we give God a praise that's louder than anything that's going on on the inside of you? Come on, can you lift your hands in spite of hallelujah? Hallelujah. You know, that's what believers do. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I think about the woman with the issue of blood. She had issues, but she had to get to Jesus. And I don't care what issue that you have this morning. I don't care what issues you're doing on, dealing with online. You still have to get to Jesus. Amen. And what an opportunity when we come together just to get to God this morning. Amen. Well, I thank you guys for coming this morning. You can have your seats. Just a few announcements before. We get into the Word of God this morning. This week starts our small groups again. Hallelujah. We're so excited about our small groups, and we would encourage you to go online. You can go to vcmicc.org and register you for your group so the facilitators know how many people to prepare for. We have all kinds of groups that we're offering this time, and I, w I really want you to go and look to and ask God what, which ones should you be a part of. If you feel like you need development in this season, we have a, a group called Develop Me. If you want to um, just find out about your financial future, we put a group together to talk about the importance of wills and estate planning and what life insurances you should get. All those things are very, very important. And so we have a group dealing with financial planning. We got all kinds of groups. We got a group called Developing Healthy Relationships, dealing with friendships, all kinds of friendships. And so I think it's important that you would go online, register, and then tell everybody else to register. Amen. How many people were here with us last week? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. It's such a good message. I, I, I went back and went over it myself, and, you know, and then Thursday night was really, really good. Just talking about how important it is in the season that we are in to be hearing from God and to just have our heart postured towards God. Last week, we talked about this church, the Ephesus church, and we talked about how John saw the vision of this church in the last days, and it was a very mature church, a church that understood doctrine, a church that understood the things of God, and understood even, even a discerning church. And he said, you've done your works very well, but your hearts are far from me. Your heart has grown cold. 
You know, we can't be in a place right now where our heart's going cold. And I know that it's such a temptation to go away from the things of God because of all the distractions that are happening right now, all the voices that are in the earth. And I promise you, you ought to just turn down the frequency and put your ear to the wall and just hear from God. I think most of us are in a position in this season where we need to hear from God. Can I get an amen? Need some direction. You know, God, what am I doing? What should I be doing? And so, you know, I remember I was meditating this week in Matthew 24. When the pandemic started, the Lord really pressed on my heart to do a study on the end days. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus, and said, how will we know the end of your coming? How do we know when this thing is about to wrap up? Like, how do we know when you'll come again? And Jesus said something that is so good. He said, listen, there will be much more evil in the earth. And because of that evil, believers, somebody say believers. It says believers' heart will grow cold. That tells me that there's some type of evil, there's something in the earth that will be released, that will be uh, present, that will cause believers' hearts to grow cold. And so what we're fighting right now as men and women of God is to fight that desire just to recline, that desire just to spiritually decline and get into a spiritual condition where you don't know where God is and nor do you desire him anymore. So you could be be in a loveless relationship. I talked about that last week. You can even be in a marriage, in a relationship, and you could be doing all the works, you know. You could be going to work. You could be coming home at night. You know, you could be washing the dishes. You could be keeping a great house. You can be taking care of the kids, but living like roommates. Like there's no intimacy. There's no communication. There's no investment of time. How many of you know healthy things grow? But in order for something to be healthy, you've got to invest time in it. You've got to spend time. There's got to be some intimacy. And if you don't do that, then it'll stop growing. And that can happen in our relationships, and that certainly can happen in our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, our relationship with God is so key. It affects our relationships with one another. I will tell you, when you are on a decline with your relationships with God, it will show up in your most intimate relationships. You wonder why you can't have meaningful and did you say things like I'm not affectionate or I don't feel like it or, you know, I'm just not that I'm just not that type of person. But I promise if you go deeper in the things of God, you will be that type of person. When you just lean in a little bit with God, lean in a little bit more in your prayer life and in communication with God, it will show up in your relationships. So this morning, I will encourage you, if you're having a stagnicity, or if you're dealing with spiritual decline, or if you're dealing with a declining relationship, do a heart check. See what's going on in your relationship with God. Amen. And so many times I realize also that the scripture says, I'm going, you all who are in the back, I'm going to skip all the way down to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. I want to read this first. I'm going to read this in God's words translation. It says, delayed hope makes one's heart, one sick at heart. Let me read that again. It says, delayed hope makes one sick at heart. It says, when your hope is delayed or when your hope is deferred or when you know what God promised you has not showed up, When you've been standing a long time and things aren't looking the way you thought, or you were right on the verge of a breakthrough and then something happened, he said, it has the ability to make your heart sick. He said, but a a fulfilled longing is a tree of life. And I want to speak just for two minutes to those whose heart may be sick, because I realize when you set out to believe God for something and it doesn't come to pass and you know it's God and you're waiting, I know there's a a temptation to decline. I know there's a temptation to just be like, well, you know, it wasn't that serious. Or did I really hear God? And then your enthusiasm and your zeal has left You know, there's a word that was released this week that literally I shared it with you all on uh, Facebook because it was something that uh, God was speaking to me about. I just thought that this person put it in 
the most wonderful words. And I want to read a little bit of it this morning. It says, hear the Lord say, it says, I haven't led you this way to tease you. I didn't move you from the familiar path to the pioneer road to disappoint you or give you false hope. I didn't give you dream after dream and sign after sign just to lead you to a dead end and a closed door. I didn't start this adventure of faith with no intention to finish it. I didn't stir up a radical fire in you just to see it slowly flicker out. And I didn't give you a love for nations just to see it dashed upon the rocks. I didn't put a holy discontentment upon your life for the norm just so you would never get to see and experience the extraordinary. I didn't put a mantle of revival upon you just to see it unused and dormant. You didn't hear wrong. Come on, somebody say, I didn't hear wrong. Because sometimes you might question, did I really hear God? Just because you don't see what he said, he says you did not hear wrong. You did not see wrong, nor did you fail the test. Because many people say, well, maybe I failed the test. He said you did not hear wrong. Yes, that was me. You did not see wrong. Sometimes you just got to close your eyes and see what God said and rehearse the promises over and over and over again. I'm telling you, while this prophecy was the same week it came out, I kept having the same dreams over and over and over again, the same dream over and over again. And someone called me and said, Pastor P, I just want to let you know I had this dream. It was really weird. And she told me her dream. It was the same dream I had. And I said, I think God is trying to let us know it ain't over. What I told you, it will come to pass. Though it tarry, wait for it. Wait for it. She said, I just feel like we ought to just declare some things. And I'm telling you, when your heart is growing sick, you ought to stand up and declare some things. You ought to say out of your mouth what God has already said. That's living from the finished work. And we just begin to declare some things over the church, over the body of Christ, and just begin to declare revival because he showed you some things, y'all. He said some things to you. You've got a vision and purpose in your heart. And this world system is coming to make you sleep. Sleep on the promises of God. Sleep on God. It's coming to wear you out. But greater is he that is on the inside of you than that devil that is in the world. You, I'm telling you, that's what I'm saying. Your praise ought to be louder than your problems. <laughs> you got to do things by faith, even when you don't feel like it. You got to do things by faith, even when it looks crazy, even when nobody else is doing it. Everybody's complaining, but I will not complain. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Oh, God, I will not back up on your promises. I know you said it. I know I heard it. And the song says, if you said it, he's a man of his word. He's not a man that he would lie, nor the son of man that he would have to repent if he said it. I don't know what he said to you this morning, but I'm trying to encourage you and cause your babies to leap again. Hallelujah. He says, you didn't hear wrong. You didn't see wrong. He said, I didn't send you to dismantle your faith and cause you to run back into the cave, Elijah. He said, I didn't set you apart to torture you with isolation and lack of community and friendships and people who know you and champion you. He said, I didn't do all this just for you to be isolated. I didn't do all this just for you to be alone with your thoughts and go crazy. I didn't bring you this far just to die. You remember what the children of Israel said? They delivered them from Egypt, and they had to go through the wilderness. And they said, did you bring us this far just to die in the wilderness? Let us go back to Egypt. And I know people are tempted in this season. I'll just go back into the world. It was easier there. Amen, lights. He says, I'm, I'm moving you. Out of the transition preparatory phase and into the building and establishing phase of your life and your calling. Thank you, Jesus. It says the nomadic lifestyle moving from place to place, season to season, and never putting down deep roots is over. 
all those cycles you've gone through, over. Come on, declare it is over. You are being led to the location that you can put your bags down and plant yourself. Ooh. It says you will finally feel like you have found your rest. I'm going to surround you with community and covenant relationships that will last a lifetime. I am clearing away the fog. In my dream, we were in a fog trying to find our way through. The great thing about my dream, every time I had it, we were still walking. And I want to encourage you this morning, keep on walking. Put one foot in front of the other and keep on walking. I declare that your steps are ordered of the Lord. If you can't see in that fog, close your eyes and let the Holy Spirit guide you. But he said, we're coming into the time where I'm going to clear the fog, where you will see clearly. God, I declare the people of God's eyes will be open and they'll be able to see further than they've ever seen in this season. God, I thank you that you are clearing the fog. You are clearing away, God. I thank you that you're putting on us on paths that you established before the foundation of the world. You know, Ruth and Naomi, they had to get on a path to get to uh, Judah, and that Judah, uh, Bethlehem, was a fruitful place, and they were in a barren place. But in order to get to that place, that path was filled of robbers and rapists. And, and mama was like, we, I'm tired. I ain't got no more fight in me. And Ruth said, I will put you on my back, but we are getting to where we are called to be. We are getting to our fruitful place. And this morning, I'm telling you, I will put you on my back. I am going to carry you to the place that God promised you. You will not stay in a barren place any longer. Get your tail up and begin to walk. God said, I will clear the fog. I will clear the way. It is still your season and it is still your time. You ought to declare that out of your mouth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo, Lord Jesus. <laughs> you got to stare up the gift. Hallelujah. <laughs> Get in your purpose. It says, uh, this is just the prophecy I'm still reading. <laughs> it says in the next few months. Come on, somebody say in the next few months. Sounds like about this time tomorrow. <laughs> about this time next year. In the next few months. You will feel like the smoke screen that has made it hard to discern and receive direction will lift. And you will get your coordinates and feel a setting in your spirit for your way forward. Father, I thank you for the way forward. Father, I thank you for the settling in our spirit, man, God. Father, I declare peace over the people of God this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you're restoring the joy of our salvation, Lord God. Lord, I thank you that you are leading the way, God. I thank you, Lord God, for a settling, a rest that's on the people of God. But in our settling and in our rest, I thank you for passion and I thank you for fervor. I thank you for purpose, Lord Jesus. God, let us not walk around in cycles anymore, but let us push through to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. And so in that pushing, you've got to make sure your heart does not become cold. You know, even, even what we just did, rehearsing what God said, looking at what God said to you personally, and beginning to pray, and thank God for it. Thanksgiving is going to be so key. It is key. The scripture said it is the password to the promise. You ought to be thankful. And so it's important that we're not just complaining and putting voice to what we're seeing that's not God. When you see something in your life that's, that's contrary to God, you ought to just pick up the word of God and begin to speak the word of God over that situation. Amen. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Because this morning, we're going we're gonna to deal with that stagnicity. And so what do you do when you feel yourself drifting? You know, the scripture says that we are all sheep. Come on, say, I'm his sheep. We are all sheep. But the scripture also says that sheep have a tendency to go astray. <laughs> it's the sheep's tendency to go astray. He says every sheep needs shepherd. We all need a shepherd. We all need God because of our tendencies to drift. Romans chapter 12, verse 11, in the English Standard Version, says, Be, do not be slothful in zeal, 
be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Slothful in zeal is to be lethargic. It is to have low energy. It is to be jaded. It is to be run down. It is to be weary. And God commands us in this scripture, get out of your funk. It's something you can do. Get out of your funk. To be fervent in spirit is the opposite. The word fervent raises the issue of st spiritual temperature. It literally means on the boil. Heat is involved. To be fervent is to be passionate and engaged. It means to be committed, active, and energetic, and motivated. It says, don't be in a funk, essentially, but keep yourself on boil serving the Lord. So unless heat is applied, the natural tendency of things is to grow cold. And I thought about this, like, I don't like cold food. I don't, I've never been, I don't like lukewarm food. I get why God says don't be lukewarm or I'll spew you out of my mouth. Because it's nasty to eat cold food or something that's supposed to be hot or is designed to be hot and you taste it and it's not the temperature it should be. I don't like when my food sits out too long. Like, I got to eat it. Like, if I pick something up from the restaurant, I'm eating it in the car, especially if it's fries, because they're designed to be hot. There's only a couple food you can eat cold that was, that was originally hot. Like, fried chicken, you might can eat that cold if it's fried right, if it's seasoned right. But most things you need hot. Like, I can't wait to get to the house. I got to eat it now. My husband's always like, push it, slow down. And I'm blowing it in my mouth. You know how you do In your mouth. Y'all know how you do that. It's better that way. It's better that way when it's, when it's in its original state, when it has heat to it, when it's designed to taste good. And God is saying, I will, you don't taste right when you're cold. I didn't design you to be cold. You got to add heat to it. You know, it's like, it's like water. Water was not, I mean, God been speaking to me, y'all. Water was not, I'm looking at water that's sitting still from a leak. Um, out, it, well, from the rain or whatever outside. And I'm like, why is that water there? And I noticed the water was not moving. And water is designed to run, to move. You know, like even the water on the inside of us, living waters, is designed to move. But I notice when the water sits still, it attracts rodents. It attracts evil. Nasty stuff. And I know when we're not moving, when you're not moving, you'll attract evil. You'll attract nasty stuff. Wondering why I'm dealing with this move, girl. Wonder why I'm dealing with this move. You know, I, I think about my husband. He's always moving. He can't sit still, just moving all the time. <laughs> so, so because I know that's the way he's designed, not just in church, I live with the man. When he's sitting still, I'm like, what's up? I know something ain't right. Because he's always moving. If he's not talking about the vision and where we're going as a church, something ain't right. If we ain't talking about the next, see, my design is, can we just hang out? Can I just be comfortable for a second? Like we just got here. Susie moving the house. What's the next house? I don't want to move. <laughs> you know, he just, he's always been like that. Always been like that. Moving, doing, hearing what God is saying, stepping out, leaping into what God is saying. It keeps your life in an adventure. But then when you're cold, you don't move. You sit. You sit with thoughts that aren't even yours. You are now able, Satan is able to access you where he could. When you're moving, he can't access you. But when you're sitting, he knows your location. I like it. I just, I just, there's so many examples of that. That's why God likes to walk in the cooler today. Walk with me. Let's move. Yeah. So I want to talk about how you apply this heat to your life. When you feel like you're growing cold, one thing I will tell you this morning is you've got to take responsibility. You got to locate yourself 
and take responsibility. We're always looking for somebody else to tell us what to do. We're always looking for somebody else to recognize us and push us and tell us something. You want to take responsibility for your own spiritual disciplines. You want to take responsibility yourself. What if nobody's there? That's what happened in this pandemic. Nobody was there. There was very little accountability. Who knows if you're online or not? Who knows what you're doing? You know, that's what God, one of the reasons why God created the church was for accountability. I know it's a cuss word, but it's in his design. But what happens when nobody's there? You've got to be, have spiritual disciplines on your own. You have to take responsibility for your own spiritual condition. One thing I know about many people who are made like me is that I got to stay in purpose. I got to stay doing what God's called me to do and not get distracted on the left or the right. I said last week, there is a way that seems right unto men, and men can be telling you, go this way and do this, but I'm, you've got to acknowledge God and everything and stay on his path. God is so good that even when you get off the path, he'll do whatever he can do to keep knocking you back on. It just takes longer. It just takes longer. Something you could accomplish quick because you got off the path. It just takes longer. You'll get there, but it just takes longer. So you're not helpless. Why are you not helpless? Because you are in charge of your own heart. Come on, help me preach. Say, I am in charge of my own heart. You online, you're in charge of your own heart. Psalms chapter 119, you know, the greatest, the, the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalms chapter 119, verse 112, it says, I turn my heart to do your decrees. Do you understand? He says, I turned my heart. I turned my heart to do your decrees forever to the end. In the easy standard version, it says, I incline my heart to perform your statures forever to the end. He says, I want this to last. I want lasting change in my life. And so I incline my heart to perform your statues. In the easy reason version, it says, more than anything, I want to obey your laws always until the end of my life. So if you've got to, he said, I'm going to incline my heart. If you have to incline your heart, if you have to incline something, that means it is naturally not in that position. It means that's a work I have to do. The, the writer says, I want to incline my heart towards your statues. It is setting your heart in the direction of something. Setting is your work, something you have to do. You don't start off loving disciplines. You just don't. But you do it till you love it. I'm going to say it again. You do it until you love it. I'm telling you how to get your heart warm again. You do it till you love it. A lot of times in marriage counseling, I'll ask the man or woman, how often do you say you love them? I don't know. Tell them every day as much as you can. Do it till you, can't, till you love it. Do it till you feel it. I don't feel it. Well, I'm telling you, if you line up with heaven and you begin to agree with heaven, and you change your thinking, you will feel it. Well, I feel like I fell out of love. Well, fall back in love. Fall back in love. You don't wake up every day all with goosebumps and, and stuff jumping in your belly. You don't wake up every day just, never mind. You don't wake up every day feeling like it. But there's certain disciplines you have to have. It's like, I don't like planks. I think they're from the devil, but I know they're not. You know, I don't like exercise. I don't like running. You know, when, 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 when a doctor doing all the stuff with you and looking at your heart and stuff, especially when looking at your heart, he says, you know, I want you to do this because I don't want you to be running one day and just fall out. And I always laugh because I'm like, that'll never happen. <laughs> because I won't never be running. I don't like running. So that ain't going to happen. I ain't going to worry about that. But there's certain disciplines that you have to have. But what I have noticed about certain, especially physical disciplines, that when you start doing it, it gets easier, and then you can't deal, do without it. Like there's something that's released. Like 
when, you, when you're exercising, there's certain hormones and things that are released that make you feel better and make the stress go. And so I got to do it every day. Well, same thing with God. When you get your spirit, I got to get to his presence. I got to, like, I might start off bored and not really know what I'm doing. But listen, when you keep doing it, you will love it. You will love it. And that's how you get your heart from becoming cold. If you got to discipline yourself to turn off everything else, that's what fasting is about. Just to turn off everything else. And I'm just going to incline my heart, put my ear to the ground. I'm, I'm going to listen to certain things. I'm going to get music going to set an atmosphere around me because I don't like the atmosphere around me right now. I'm going to rehearse what he said. The scripture said in big block letters, I'm going to put it up. Put it up on my mirror. Put it up in the bathroom. Put it up in the room. I'm going to put it up so every time I read it, I'm going to rehearse the promises of God. This is who I am. Because many times when your hearts grow cold, you start living a version of yourself God never created you to live. It's almost like Jacob. You remember when he wrestled with God in Genesis chapter two, 32? You know, you, that is so phenomenal. But he began to, the Bible says the heavens opened. He saw something. What if he saw Israel? Remember, God changed his name. What if he saw while he was wrestling in his discipline with God, he saw who he really is? I don't know about you. When I get into the presence of God, God is always showing me who I really am. And I realize that I'm living beneath my means. I start to realize that these lies that we live in out, that's what God says, bring me your truth. Go ahead and bring me these truths that you think are true that is not the truth. Like I got to be like this because my daddy left and because I was abused as a child. And, you know, I can't love because my mother never hugged me. And, you know, all these things that may have happened. But when Jesus came in your life, he redeemed your life from destruction. He bought you back. He gave you a new history. Your history is now his story. I know that might be a little too deep for y'all. <laughs> and so he says, incline. I've got to incline my heart. And so you've got to act upon it in order to, for it to move in a different direction. And so you don't already incline something that's already upright. If you don't incline, you'll begin to recline like a recliner. You know, you get in a recliner and at first you're just sitting. But then it has different, you know, ways that you can go back and back until you're, it's designed for you to go to sleep. Reclining is designed for you to sleep. And there's so many times in the scriptures, when it's talking about the last days, it's telling the believer to wake up. Wake up. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 in the Message Bible. It says, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me, and you want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. That is God's decree. He said, I'll make sure. But unless he said, you got to come looking for me. And not just the notes. We know God is there. That means you just got to incline towards him. You got to get your passion back. You got to pick up your bed and walk. That's the first thing he told the man by the pool of Bethesda. He said, pick up your bed and walk. I love that story because it's almost like he said he was like that for 39 years. 39 years. What's wrong with you? Won't no man put me in the pool? You mean in 39 years, you couldn't come up with some type of strategy to get in that pool? You mean you watch everybody else go deeper? You watch everybody else get breakthrough? You watch everybody else get healed? And all you could do is come up with an excuse as to why you can't get healed? Pick up your bed. Pick up that comforter. That thing that you're cut. Pick that comforter up. Walk. I want you to see your responsibility in this this morning. Pick up your bed. He didn't lay hands on him. He didn't pick yourself up and walk. 39 years? Pick yourself up and walk. All that man needed was a word from God. How many words do you have? All he needed was 
to hear God. How many times have you heard him? Pick up your bed and walk. Think about what's on the bed. You got a pillow. You got a comforter. You got a fitted sheet. You got everything. I mean, when you get to a certain age, that bed got to be right. I don't know about you, but my bed got to be right. It got to be made right. It got to smell right. It got to feel right. It's its job to lull me to sleep. <laughs> my family's laughing at me because they know it's the truth. Everything got to be right with that bed. Got to have the right pillow. Don't take my pillow. Everybody got their own pillows in the house because I know what pillow makes my neck sit just right to go to sleep. <laughs> Here God is saying, get rid of it all. I don't want you comfortable. And so sometimes to, to be whole or to walk in what God has for you means getting rid of your comfort. And it takes courage to be made whole. It takes courage to not be the one always needing something. It takes courage to be the Mary, sit at the feet of Jesus. Excuse me. And so it says, guard your heart. Incline your heart. And I'm going to tell you to guard your heart. Your heart is the seat of your emotions. And so I know right now, that your emotions could be all over the place. You're never always going to wake up on 10. Nobody always gets up on 10. Like every morning when I get up, I've got to talk to him first. First of all, thank you, God, for the breath that you put in my body. And I declare this is the day you've made, and I will rejoice. And be glad in it. And then I say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I got to talk to myself. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, in all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And I cancel every assignment that the enemy might bring on my life. I cancel it off of this day in the name of Jesus. Thank you for daily loading me with benefits. I thank you for the benefits of the day. I thank you for the daily word. God, I thank you have a word for me today. This is all before I even get out the bed. Because how many of you know the enemy meets you too? There's another day you just got to go to work. You got 15 Zooms. Get Where's your zeal? Where's your commitment? Where's your energy? It all comes from God. Proverbs chapter 4 gives us some instructions. It says, guard your heart, verse 23. Guard your heart more than anything else. Because the source of your life flows from it. You got to ask yourself, what's trying to get in my heart? Now, I told you that Matthew, he says, the evil in the world will do its best to affect the believer. What is trying to get in your heart? What is trying to affect your emotions? He says, guard it. That means you got to put guards up. Some of us need to put guards up around our homes. We just allow too much in our homes. We've opened the door. We've cracked it a little bit and allowed things in our homes. It says, guard that stuff. Guard your heart. In the Living Bible, it says, above all else, <laughs> guard your affections, for they influence everything else in your life. Guard your heart. Guard your affections. That's something we do. He said, because out of your heart flows the issues of life, and you'll have issues because you didn't guard your heart. Like, triggers go up for me when I need to guard my heart. When someone is saying something that I don't need to hear, triggers go up. Like, I don't want to get that in my heart. Or if I put my eyes to something, you know how you was when you first got saved? Like when you first got saved, you, you know, last week I told you to remember how you were first. And so you remember how you just wouldn't just put your eyes to anything? You wouldn't just say anything? You know, you just wouldn't linger in stuff too long because it will affect you. And now we're in a place where that don't affect me. But it does affect you because now your heart has grown cold. You allow things, the proverb says trash, 
in there to cause your heart to go whole. Now, I can't tell you what it is for you. I can't tell you what spiritual disciplines you need. I can't tell you what you need to guard your heart against. But I promise you, you know. You know what you need to guard. That's just not for me. That's why we can't get into a legalistic law thing. We can't. Because, because I can't preach to you what you know what sin is. And the Bible says that the sin gives you no confidence. It does not affect God. It does not affect God's love towards you. It doesn't affect God. Sin affects your heart. And so sin will get in your heart. And in 1 John, it says you'll have no confidence because your own heart condemns you. So you step out to do what God calls you to do, and you're condemned because of your heart. Your heart is condemning you. It's like turning on you. You say things like, this might not be for me no more. Well, I just don't do, I'm just going, I'm not going to do that no more. And you back up from what you know God's called you to do. You back up for your purposes. You do, you have no fervency. There's no zeal. You're conflicted. You got questions. (laughs) And that's because of what you allowed in. And it says your heart will begin to condemn you. But the scripture says that God is greater than your heart. That is good news. He says, you tripping. You tripping because of what you let in, but I'm greater than all that. All you got to do is incline your heart. Take that heart, that dirty, nasty, conflicted heart, and lift it up towards me. Begin to give me your heart. God says, I'll give you a new one. He says, above all else, guard your heart because that process, it can take a while. To get through all the mess, to get through all the noise, to get through all the what else. He said, incline your heart and guard your heart for the influences, everything else in your life. And so here's some ways to move the thermostat of your heart. Number one, don't make God an option. I know that sounds so basic, but you don't know how many people making God an option in their heart. You've got to stay desperate. Desperate for God. Desperate for him. Like I said last week, like a child. Just, God, I need you. I need you, God. Please. (laughs) Don't make him an option. God is not an option in my life. Come on, say, God is not an option. He's just not something I check off. not an option. I I have worship things on my phone, and I was listening to some worship last night. Uh, William McDowell, love you, brother. I'm telling you, that that man will worship all night. And he has this song, I Don't Want to Leave. And that song was born out of a place of the Lord told him to hold these worship concerts where he just would tarry. You know, we don't really do that anymore because we're programmed. Um, And there's reasons for programs. Honestly, there is. But he would hold these sessions for the worshipers. And he said the Lord told him, just tarry till I come. And he said he thought he knew what that meant. Because, you know, we do it in church. We have our moments. We may go over about 30 minutes in worship, and that's nice. And he said that would happen. And he said, no, it would be ours. He said, people would be (laughs) leaving. And he said, the Lord would say, just wait, just wait, just wait. And he said, he noticed the ones that stayed, the ones that needed Jesus. He said, the ones that stayed were the people in the wheelchairs. He said, the ones that had uh, ailments that, you know, they were going to die, the ones who were sick of their marriage. He just would take notice around the room of the ones who were desperate, knowing I've tried everything else. I know I need God. That's what I'm talking about, desperation. 
And he said, it, and it was, it's documented, I read the paper because he said it was documented in the paper where this lady had an issue. She was in a wheelchair, had supposed to die, blah, all that stuff. And she tarried and she tarried just calling on the name of Jesus. And she said, if I could just stay here in this presence, she said, I don't care. And this, is her, this was her position. I don't care who leaves. If I'm the last one here, as long as the pastor keeps the sanctuary open, I'm going to stay here until I'm healed. It was the next day that woman got out her chair, completely healed. I can't even tell you all the things that are wrong with her. Completely healed. And so he, that song was born out of that moment, I don't want to leave. And he's like, I just think I'm called to those who are desperate. And I said to myself, shouldn't we all be? So if you're cold or you know your heart's going cold, I want you to think this morning just about the prodigal son. Think about him. Remember, he, he thought that he had everything he needed to leave his father. He said, give me my inheritance, and I'm going to leave my father. And he left as a representation of going away from God. You all, most of us know the story. He was in the street, was doing his thing, and realized he needed God. And the awesome thing about his desperation is that when he came back, he didn't have no entitlements. There was no, I am this, I am the son, I am this. It was, I will feed the pigs if you just let me in. I will eat with the pigs. <laughs> That's good enough. I'll stand at the door and greet the people. I don't just let me in. I just, I just want to be around. I want to be back in my father's house. I want to be back in my father's presence. I have no entitlement. Nothing. I'm desperate for you. My heart's grown cold, and I just want to feel it beat again. And the great thing about that story is the father was always on the road waiting. I told you last week, he never moves. We moved. He crowned his son. No matter where you are today, he's crowning you. He says, you're eating pig slop because of your heart. I didn't call you to eat the slop. called you to reign with kings. And this morning, you may be one who is, maybe you haven't even found your way back. Maybe you have allowed the pandemic or whatever is going on in your life cause your heart to get cold. And you're in a loveless relationship, whether that be with God, whether it be in your marriage, whatever, you're in a loveless relationship. You need to clown your heart. You need to turn your affections towards God. You realize you need him. You need a savior. We all do. I want to pray for you this morning. Really, it's called rededication. It's just repenting, turning from some things, getting back to the first things. I said last week, let's get back to the simplicity, the single-hearted devotion to God. And so again, if that's you this morning, you need to add some heat to that coldness you need that water to move. I want you to just bow your head, even if you're in your home. I just want you to bow your head. And I just want you to take a moment in your own heart. You can have a conversation with God right here in your own heart. He knows you better than you know yourself. You know, David said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, oh God. God, I need you. I need you. I'm desperate for you, Jesus. I incline my heart and tend to your saints. I get back in position with you, God. I thank you for the fulfillment of every promise on my life. I repent, Lord God, of allowing my heart to even be sick. 
God, I'm praying that you restore the joy of their salvation. I thank you, Lord God, for restoration. God, I thank you for times of refreshing that only come from your presence. I thank you for your presence in everybody's life this morning, those who are online and those who are in the sanctuary. I thank you for sweet encounters with you. God, I thank you each and every one of us get back to our sweet spot. God, whether that is a better prayer life, whether that's a better devotion life, just getting in your word again, receiving revelation knowledge from your word, cause your word to be life to those that have put it down, Lord God. God, even the marriages that have grown, grown loveless, thank you for restore, restoration of love in the marriages. Thank you for renewing relationships, Lord Jesus. God, I thank you for direction. Even in this moment, we thank you for speaking and showing, for direction for those who don't know, for those who have stopped, for those who have turned back, for those who have quit because it got too hard. I thank you for strength. I thank you for direction for them. I thank you you're clearing a way and clearing a path. And I thank you in not in many days they'll see a clear path. Father, I thank you for courage for those, Lord God, who need to pick up their beds and walk. I thank you for courage to be made whole, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the strength, God, just to turn away from things we know are not good for us and start to walk towards you. For this I give you praise, hallelujah, with much thanksgiving. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Listen, this spot right here is where you should live. Just in this single-hearted devotion to God to keep your heart warm. Keep your heart burning for him. Don't be part of the believers in the last days that have grown cold. You wouldn't know Jesus if he walked past. Don't be a part of that group. I love you so much. <laughs>